good morning you know in uh, this class we will develop the equation for vj as we left it in the last class we told ourselves you have any high pressure container it has a chamber pressure let us say pc i have something like a hole or a vent through which hot gases are squirting out i want to find out the efflux velocity which i call as jet velocity or we call it as efflux velocity vj and this is what but however before i do that since there was this question of uh, specific impulse and unit of specific impulse let us just spend some 2 or 3 minutes on this issue. What was specific impulse? We told ourselves specific impulse is equal to I divided by the mass of the propellant that is the impulse generated by MP mass of propellant. What is impulse? Change of momentum which is equal to MP into the momentum Vj divided by MP which is equal to Vj. As per this equation, the unit of specific impulse should be meter per second, which is same as the efflux velocity Vj. But how did I define specific impulse? I defined it as impulse per mass flow of propellant. In other words, impulse has unit of momentum, change of momentum kilogram meter per second divided by kilogram. And when I say impulse, I give a certain force over a given time. That means, I can write the change of momentum as equal to kilogram meter per second square into second divided by kilogram. And this is the force, mass into acceleration is the force, which I call as Newton second by kilogram. Therefore, I also see that the unit of specific impulse can be expressed in Newton second by kilogram, right. So far so good, let us go to the third one, derive it instead of putting it as impulse, supposing I were to write the same expression for specific impulse as equal to impulse per unit time divided by mass flow rate of propellant per unit time. And what is impulse per unit time is force, force into time is impulse. In other words, I have force divided by m p dot. In other words, force has units of Newton, mass flow rate has units of kilogram per second. Therefore, the unit of impulse, specific impulse again comes out to be Newton second by kilogram. Therefore, whether I express specific impulse as impulse per propellant mass or specific impulse as force per unit mass flow rate, I get the same unit as Newton second by kilogram. Therefore, the unit for specific impulse is Newton second by kilogram. The unit for impulse should have been I as equal to Newton into second. That is what gives me the value of impulse kilogram meter per second as Newton second. Therefore, let us keep these things very clear. Impulse has unit of force into seconds Newton second, specific impulse has unit of Newton second by kilogram. But well, there are many textbooks which specify the specific impulse not in meter per second, not in Newton second by kilogram, but rather in seconds. See, when I say the specific impulse is so much meters per second, I could have also taken meter per second here, straight here, meter per second. I multiply both numerator and denominator by kilogram and kilogram. And what is it I get? I get the unit of Vj as equal to kilogram meter per second, right, divided by kilogram. Now, I again multiply the numerator and denominator by second, which gives me kilogram meter per second square into what do I get? Second per unit kilogram and this gives me Newton second by kilogram. 
Therefore, meter per second is actually identical to Newton's second by kilogram. Therefore, either of the units is okay. But there are many textbooks which still continue to define specific impulse in terms of seconds. Why do they use seconds? You know, they also specify force in kilogram or pounds. Therefore, pounds and pounds get cancelled second. Therefore, whenever somebody gives in seconds, it is my duty to multiply it by the conversion constant G C and then use it in Newton second by kilogram. Maybe you all should go through it, but in this class we will always address specific impulse in Newton second by kilogram or in terms of meter per second both of which you have the same identical units. See units are very important in engineering you know without units we will be talking of something but getting some other figure as it were. Having said that let us get back to our problem. We want to find the V j we derived the equation for a control volume we said q dot minus the work done by the particular vent let us say w x divided by let us say m dot is equal to the enthalpy which is leaving let us say h e plus the kinetic energy which is leaving. We told ourselves that the change in potential energy between this and this if the datum is about the same is the same therefore, I can forget it therefore, I get minus h i plus the kinetic energy what is entering at i right. And we told ourselves we are looking per unit mass this is enthalpy per unit mass let us put the units clearly. The unit of h e is therefore, joule per kilogram the kinetic energy is equal to v square divided by 2 and that is equal to meter square per second square and multiply numerator and denominator as usual by kilogram by kilogram meter square by second square this is equal to kilogram meter per second square that means Newton meter per kilogram which is equal to joule per kilogram. Therefore, the kinetic energy V square by 2 has units of joule per kilogram that means, we are taking per unit mass of the gas which is moving what is the kinetic energy. Therefore, let us put things together we told ourselves well it is adiabatic nozzle or adiabatic vent it is it is not something which is which which can dilate and all that you know if you were to apply the same problem to our heart valve. See heart also pumps pumps our blood right, but the valve is also something which is flexible. When we write the same equation for a control volume for the flow through blood through one of our valves in the body may be w x is not 0 may be that is what makes makes modeling of the heart a little more difficult compared to a vent over here. Therefore, now let us put things together we have v j square which is equal to the exit velocity and that is equal to 2 of the enthalpy which is entering minus enthalpy which is exiting the nozzle. And of course, I had v j square divided by 2 and therefore, I had h i minus h e over here is it all right. Now, I want to solve this equation and I want to make sure that I solve it in terms of the properties of this particular gas. And what are the gas properties could be the temperature could be the molecular mass could be some other properties which we need to consider. Now, to be able to solve this I have to make further assumptions let it, let me assume that the gas is ideal. What do we mean that the gas is ideal a gas is ideal when the enthalpy per unit mass or the specific enthalpy and specific internal energy are only functions of temperature. I think these definitions are important let me just briefly go through when the enthalpy is only a function of temperature and the internal energy is only a is only a function of temperature we say that the gas is ideal. And what what is the consequence of this we have the definition that h minus u or rather we define enthalpy 
as equal to u plus p into the specific volume and therefore we find for an ideal gas h is a function of temperature internal energy is a function of temperature plus p v or rather we get p into the specific volume is only a function of temperature and therefore I write it as R t and therefore an ideal gas for which enthalpy and internal energy are only functions of temperature has an equation of state which specifies P v is equal to R t and this R is what we call as specific gas constant right. Let us again just repeat what we said. We tell ourselves for an ideal gas, maybe H as a function of temperature is only a function of temperature. Similarly, U is only a function of temperature. And now, if I take the slope anywhere, I get the value of Cp is equal to dH by dt, and I get Cv is equal to du by dt. How did this come? For any system we have dq minus dw is equal to du. For a constant volume system work done is 0. Therefore, heat required per unit temperature change per unit mass is therefore the value of Cv is equal to du by dt. That means it has nothing. That means for a constant volume system, work done is 0, I get this. For a constant pressure system, what did we do? We define, we instead of writing du, I write now, I have it as d of h minus pv. And now I have pdv, vdp, I have pdv over here, it cancels off, and I get cp is equal to dh by dt. Therefore, we are still considering an ideal gas, specific gas constant R and what is the unit for R? Yes, let us put it down, pressure Newton per meter square into volume meter cube by kilogram, it is specific volume. I have something like 1 over Kelvin coming over here. Newton meter joule per kilogram Kelvin. That means I have joule per kilogram Kelvin, which for air is something like 287 is the value and it is specific to the gas. Air has a value of 287, maybe CO2 will have a lower value, maybe helium may have a higher value. This is R depend, depends on the type of gas which we use. So far, so good. Therefore, we say well I have the equation of this gas is given by P V is equal to R T or if I consider a volume of gas V which has a certain mass m, I can write the same equation as P capital V is equal to m R T right and this is what we have been studying in thermodynamics. Is it alright? Now, let us go forward. Now, I ask myself See, in, now I find when I look at H as a function of temperature, U as a function of temperature, the curve is varying, Cp is also a function of temperature, Cp keeps varying. And now if I have to write from this equation, I write dH is equal to Cp dt or rather the enthalpy of a mass of gas M capital H is equal to M Cp into dt. Now Cp is going to change with temperature. Now, my problem is going to become more and more complicated because I have to consider the Cp variations with temperature. Therefore, I put another idealization and this idealization I say the gas is even better than ideal. I call it as a perfect gas and a perfect gas is one in which Cp and Cv are constants. In addition to the value of H being a function of temperature, we again put one more assumption and tell ourselves well the, the functional dependence is not like this, but the functional dependence is straight such that it is constant, U is constant and therefore Cp is now a constant. 
this becomes my perfect gas. Therefore, we will solve this equation assuming now let us say a perfect gas and if I were to assume a perfect gas I will now let us say P c the gas which is here at P c has a temperature T c let the exit temperature at this plane be let us say T e. Therefore, now my, my job is clear I know my definitions let me just quickly derive the value of V j. I now write V j square is equal to 2 of H i minus H e C p is a constant is equal to 2 C p into the value H i minus H e H i the temperature is T c we should not confuse T c the exit temperature is T e therefore, it is equal to all right. Now, I want to find out what is the value of C p. I want to know the properties of C p of the gas in terms of let us say the gas constant may be may be in terms of the molecular mass of the gas. Therefore, I again go through and say well C p by C v is equal to gamma specific heat ratio. Also we know from H minus u is equal to P v is equal to R t I get the expression C p minus C v is equal to R. How did this come H minus u is equal to P v which is equal to R t I take differential d H by d t d u by d t is equal to r therefore, it is equal to the specific gas constant. Now, I find r keeps changing with the type of gas and uh, supposing I keep changing the gas here I have to change the value of r why not express it in terms of a uh, universal gas constant. Which is same for all gases namely r that is r 0. And now how do I define R 0 compared to R? Let us again talk in terms of little more basics over here. What did we tell ourselves when we started the course? We told ourselves the quantity of matter we just express in terms of kg. I have a given matter and how do I say kg? Well somebody may be in 1827 or 1830 he kept some mass in some lab in France severs which I say is 1 kg and based on 1 kg I say oh this some quantity of matter weighs 2 kg. Therefore, quantity of matter is what I express in kg, but why, why the hell should it be kg it could be any other unit. You know instead of saying that let us say that the mass of this duster is let us say 500 grams why not express it in some other unit and let the molecular mass be something like 500 grams per mole is the molecular mass of the wood of this particular duster. Now, the molecular mass if the mass of this duster is equal to 500 grams then I can as well say that this duster contains 1 mole of the substance. In other words the instead of defining the mass of this duster as 500 grams I can say I the duster consists of 1 mole of the substance wood. Therefore, I can also define the duster in terms of a mole just as we define it in terms of 500 grams. Getting back to some more details we must remember that this mole is different from the number of molecules. The number of molecules in one mole is what we call as Avogadro's number A B O and the number of molecules in one, one mole is 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 
In other words, one mole of any substance has something like 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 molecules. Now, we must be a little more clear and let me take one more example. Supposing I consider, let us say a box, an empty box into which I put, let us say 1 kg of oxygen. Now, instead of saying 1 kg of oxygen, I did rather describe this oxygen in terms of moles of oxygen. We all know that the oxygen O2 has a, has a molecular weight or molecular mass of 32 grams per mole. Therefore, instead of saying I have 1 kg of oxygen, I can as well say I have 1000 divided by 32 so much moles of oxygen. Therefore, to, to clearly state the, the amount of matter which is there or amount of matter which is available, I can express it either in mass or in terms of moles of a substance. Now, therefore, what did I just now do? Let us, let us erase this part. I gave you the equation as saying P into specific volume and P is pressure as Newton per meter square, volume has units of meter cube by kilogram as equal to RT, where R is specific gas constant, R as units of joule per kilogram Kelvin and temperature has units of Kelvin. right? Now, instead of expressing the specific volume in meter cube by kilogram, I can also write it as P into I write meter cube per mole. I just use this unit and if I write this, my right hand side becomes R naught T, where R naught for all gases the value is the same which I call as the universal gas constant. In other words, I write P V is equal to N R 0 T instead of writing P V is equal to M R T. If I consider M in kilograms, I have R T. If I consider in terms of mole, I get the same value of R for all gases, which now becomes universal and I say R naught is universal gas constant, which, which should have the units. Let us put the units together, joule per mole Kelvin and the value is 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. Therefore, we just refreshed ourselves a little bit about thermodynamics. We say we are talking in terms of a perfect gas for which C V, C P are constants. We also learn to distinguish between R and R naught, which is very primary, which is, which is very essential. Therefore, now I can go back to this particular equation and then tell myself, well, we had also got this equation as equal to 2 C P of T C minus T E. And we said that C p minus C v is R, C p by C v is gamma and therefore, I could write that same equation as C p into 1 minus C v by C p is C p by C v. That is C p minus C v, C v comes here 1 minus gamma is equal to the specific gas constant R. Let us keep the unit we were clear, R has units of joule per kilogram Kelvin. C p has units, heat required per unit mass per unit Kelvin, C p and R has the same units and therefore, I can write the value of C p as equal to gamma R by gamma minus 1. Supposing I want to write it, you know R keeps changing from gas to gas. Supposing I want to write it in terms of the molecular mass, all what I do is instead of writing R in joule per kilogram. I have to write R in terms of joule per mole Kelvin. Therefore, I, I just say R by comparing P V is equal to M R T, P V is equal to N R 0 T, I get R is equal to R 0 by the 
molecular mass where molecular mass in kilogram per mole or rather if I were to now simplify it I get the value of Cp in joules per kilogram Kelvin as equal to gamma R0 by the molecular mass m into gamma minus 1. Any doubts here? I just swallowed one or two small steps and what the steps which I swallowed were we told ourselves we could write PV volume in meter cube is equal to MRT or rather this could also be written as NR0T. This is joule per mole Kelvin, this is joule per kilogram Kelvin and therefore to convert R to R0 I have to take the molecular mass that means R0 divided by molecular mass is equal to this or rather R0 has units of joule per mole Kelvin and if I have to convert joule per kilogram Kelvin into mole Kelvin if I have to convert the universal gas constant R0 whose unit is joule per mole Kelvin into a specific gas constant R whose unit is joule per kilogram Kelvin I have to use that is R0 divided by the molecular mass of the particular gas I am interested in kilogram per mole or rather now I get joule per mole Kelvin into kilogram per mole, mole and mole get cancelled and the unit becomes joule per kilogram Kelvin which is the specific gas constant. Therefore, we have R is equal to R0 divided by the molecular mass of the particular substance. Therefore, let us now substitute this and if I were to substitute the whole expression here what is it I get? Vj square is equal to 2 I have gamma R0 divided by I, I get the value of molecular mass into gamma minus 1. Is it all right? And now I get the value of Tc minus Te. Let me take Tc into this particular bracket. I get 2 gamma R0. Keep our units clear. Joule per mole Kelvin into Tc divided by molecular mass of the gas kilogram per mole into gamma minus 1 into I have. 1 minus T by T C. This is going to be your square of the efflux velocity of the jet velocity. See a time has come to make little more assumptions on the motion of the gas because for me you know the temperature of the gas in that particular balloon or the container can be known, but I do not know what is the exit temperature, but I know the exit pressure I would like to convert it. Therefore, let us assume the next set of assumptions or the assumption assume flow through the vent or flow through the hole is adiabatic. Well, we had already assumed it right we said q is equal to 0. Therefore, as a corollary yeah flow through the vent is adiabatic, but let us make one more small assumption let us assume that the flow through this particular vent is quite slow. What do I mean by slow? I mean it is quite slow, slow enough such that the flow is reversible. What do you mean the flow is reversible? In other words the flow is not so fast that it cannot retrace back, it goes through a series of equilibrium states and therefore I say that the flow through the vent is adiabatic and reversible or rather the word is isentropic. And if I have an isentropic flow, well the equation of state for or the equation for the process involving this isentropic process is going to be P V to the power gamma is a constant or rather I have P into rho to the power gamma is a constant 
but I know that for an ideal gas or a perfect gas may be ideal perfect gas is better than an ideal gas I have P by rho t is a constant equation of state and therefore based on this I can write the same equation as P 1 over gamma divided by rho is again another constant let us say C 1 I just take the gamma th root on both sides and now I compare this equation along with this equation and I say I take this equation and divide it by this particular equation and now I get the value as p to the power 1 minus 1 over gamma rho gets cancelled divided by t is a constant and therefore now I can write the equation as the value of T e by T c is equal to maybe based on that equation T e by T c is equal to P e by P c to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma gamma minus 1 by gamma divided by T T goes on top I have T e I have P e here P e by P c is equal to T e by T c. Therefore, what happens to my jet velocity? Now I get my expression for jet velocity is equal to 2 gamma r naught T c divided by gamma minus 1 into the molecular mass of the gas into 1 minus the value of P e by P c to the power gamma minus 1 by gamma close bracket. so many meters per second and this is the expression for the efflux jet velocity. That means we have been able to derive and what were the assumptions a perfect gas there is the vent is adiabatic it is a reversible flow it is a slow flow and that gives me the jet velocity as so much meters per second. If this expression if the reason for this expression is clear maybe we can we all we have to do is describe this equation or draw conclusions based on this equation and that is what I will be doing in the next couple of minutes. But is it clear how we get the jet velocity see it is quite simple it is just a simple algebraic manipulation the only assumption which we have made is the flow through the vent is adiabatic and also reversible because we said it is a slow process ok you know these two assumptions we must keep in mind because I will try to relax it as I go along. Now let us discuss it out when will I get a high value of Vj when the temperature of my balloon or air is very high and what does it tell me it tells me if I use something like a cold gas such something like let us say I take the same balloon I use as, as a rocket my, my balloon over here. I have this particular vent over here I have the balloon which was initially air at 35 degrees centigrade that means if my temperature is small I do not get a very high value of Vj. If I can increase this temperature in some way I can get a much higher Vj and that is why a hot gas is better than a cold gas. I could have a cold gas rocket I could have a hot gas rocket but hot gas is definitely better. Therefore first thing we say is maybe Tc as high as possible but is there some limitation well the material must withstand the high temperature and therefore there is a limit to this temperature we normally use temperatures of the order of 3000 to 4000 Kelvin this is the type of temperature and how do we generate it we burn fuel and oxygen which we call as propellants that means we use chemical reactions to generate high temperature and high value of Tc. Therefore a rocket could be a cold gas rocket could be a hot gas rocket could be a chemical rocket and in a chemical rocket you generate high temperature using chemical reactions in a hot gas rocket maybe I could put some resistance wire heat the gases and allow the gases to come it becomes a hot gas rocket or I make something hot and push it out or if I use a cold gas I just use a cold gas mind you cold gas rockets are also used 
in satellites or something wherein I cannot carry, I cannot allow chemical reactions to take place. I just allow gas in a chamber and allow the gas to expand and I can get a thrust. And you know you could also have nuclear reactions and if nuclear reactions I can get even higher temperature, I can get higher jet velocity and you have classifications of rocket cold known as cold gas rocket, hot gas rocket, chemical rockets, nuclear rocket, maybe we will have to keep on going. Therefore, we say well temperature is one of the primary causes. Let us take a look at any other parameter, let us take a look at the exit pressure. If exit pressure is very small vacuum, well this becomes small therefore, maybe I would like to say P must be small or if my exit pressure cannot be small, I can say P C must be large. That means, I, if I can store gas at very high pressure, I can get a higher value of specific impulse. In other words, the ratio P E by P C must be small or rather the chamber pressure must be high and the exit pressure must be small. Second conclusion from this equation, is there any other conclusion I can draw? Let us take a look at the molecular mass of the gases which are exhausted. It tells me directly Vj is equal to 1 over under root of m. That means, if I can have a gas which is very light molecular mass like hydrogen or let us say helium, well my Vj will be higher. But how do I get a light gas? Let us take an example. Supposing I have a chemical rocket in which I take carbon, I burn it with oxygen and I get products of combustion as carbon dioxide C plus half O2 or C plus O2, why, why, why should I make it clumsy? Complete combustion stoichiometric, I have another rocket wherein I have H plus O2 giving me H2O rather 2H2 plus O2 giving me 2H2O. Now let us let us see what is the difference in these two rockets. This gives me a temperature in oxygen of around 3200 Kelvin. This gives me around 3300 Kelvin at the same pressure conditions. Therefore, temperature is not very much different. Now I look at the molecular mass of carbon dioxide. The molecular mass is equal to 12 plus 32 44 gram per mole for water the molecular mass is 16 plus 2 18. In other words, if I burn hydrogen and oxygen, I get a very low molecular mass and my V j which is directly proportional to the under root of m will therefore, be large and that is why we find hydrogen is a preferred fuel. any amount, I have a solid propellant, I would like my solid propellant to contain as much hydrogen as possible or if I have a liquid propellant to carry hydrogen is difficult, I liquefy hydrogen at low temperatures and that is what makes cryogenic rocket. To have a better performance, in fact if I were to give you a number, the Vj for a cryogenic rocket is around 4600 Newton second by kilogram, whereas for an ordinary fuel it is of the order of 3500 Newton second by kilogram. You get immense benefits out of this and the reason being only the value of molecular mass. Therefore, I think we must be very clear, let us put 1 temperature, 2 P, 3 mass which must be as low as possible. Can you say what must be gamma now? We are left with one small thing, others are we have already discussed. Should gamma be small or large and if so why? <coughs> yes? What do you find Vj goes as gamma over gamma minus 1 under root of course. 
Therefore, should you like a small value of gamma or large value of gamma? Let us divide numerator and denominator by gamma 1 by 1 minus 1 over gamma. Therefore, I find if I have a smaller value of gamma, I subtract a larger number. A small value is preferable because uh, gamma must be small, right? Because if gamma is small, I subtract a larger quantity and my denominator comes down and my numerator goes up, vj is larger. Therefore, I, I also tell myself, well, gamma must also be small. But you know, do I, what is the sensitivity of gamma? It is directly proportional to m. Here it is gamma by gamma minus 1. Gamma is not very much affecting. Now, let us take an example. How do I make gamma small? How do I make gamma large? How does gamma depend on the gas? We tell ourselves, yeah, we go through some examples. We tell ourselves, well, helium, which is a monoatomic gas, has a value of gamma equal to 1.67, or rather, which is equal to 5 by 3. If I take air, gamma is equal to 1.4. If I take nitrogen or oxygen, it is 1.4. It is a diatomic gas. It is monoatomic gas. This is true for oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen and all that. The gas becomes more and more complicated. Let us say CO2. Gamma is around 1.35 or something. And I make the gas extremely complicated like I have freon molecule which is used as a refrigerant. Gamma is of the order of 1.1. That means, as the molecular mass of the gas increases, the gamma becomes smaller. Now, what is it I am telling? If the molecule or if the gas is more complex, say gamma is smaller and therefore, the influence on Vj is Ej will be better. But if I look at the molecular mass, I tell myself if the exhaust, if the molecular mass is small, then I get a smaller value, it is just contradictory. Therefore, the role of molecular mass and gamma is just the opposite, but it so happens the effect of gamma is much smaller and therefore, we would still like to have a lighter gas, uh, to be exhausted out or to be a part of the efflux. Maybe I will just repeat the four salient conclusions which I draw from this particular jet velocity equation. What were the things? Well, the temperature of the gases must be as high as possible. The ratio of P by P C must be small or rather the ratio of the chamber pressure to the exit pressure must be as large as possible. 3, molecular mass of the gas which is coming out must be as small as possible. Last, we would like gamma to be small, but this gamma being small contradicts the requirement of a small molecular mass and therefore, we do not really pay so much attention to gamma. Well, these are the conclusions which we draw from this equation. Let me quickly go through these conclusions on the slide because I I plotted the equations for different values of temperature. Let me go through the first one over here. As you see, I have plotted the value of Vj in meters per second as a function of temperature. The temperature varies from 300 to 3800 Kelvin. And this is the range of uh, chemical rockets is of the order of maybe something like 3000 to 4000 Kelvin, much lower than 4000 and therefore, I restrict myself to 3800 here. I also plot for different values of P e by P c. You find that as the value of P e by P c decreases, I get a higher value of jet velocity, right. And this is the conclusion which we looked at the equation and drew. Let us now come back and ask ourselves, if I have let us say a gas at low temperature like a cold gas rocket and if I have a cold gas rocket, 
if I increase the value of or if I decrease the value of P by P C from 0.1 to 0.001 I do not really get much benefit. Whereas, if I have a high temperature rocket T C is high I get a much larger benefit. Therefore, if I were to design a cold gas rocket I can make a small I do not need to really expand it out much I can have a lower chamber pressure. Therefore, the fourth conclusion I draw is maybe for a cold gas rocket let us write put it down these are important conclusions for a cold gas rocket for which T c is quite small we do not really require a small value of P by T c right. Because you find when the temperature is small the gain what I got in going from this to this is only this much you know I expand it out so much I increase the pressure P c so much, but still I do not get benefit. Whereas, if I have really a high temperature or a chemical rocket which gives me higher temperature I am much better off. In the next one I plot the value of the jet velocity in meters per second as a function of the molecular mass. I find when the molecular mass is small I get the value of V j which is higher and of course, the same trend continues this is at a mean temperature of 3000 Kelvin and therefore, this tells me very clearly that as the molecular mass is smaller I get a higher value of V j here this is the second one here. The last one wherein I show the value of gamma here I show the value of V j as a function of gamma what I find is at a low value of P by P c of 0 0.1 or at a value of P by P c of 0 0.1 gamma really does not influence I find that the curve is quite flat it is independent of gamma as it were. Whereas, when the value of P by P c is quite small of the order of 0 0 1 I find as gamma increases I get a smaller value or rather the conclusion which we drew was as as gamma decreases the value of V j increases it is seen to be more more valuable or to be seen more at a smaller value of P e by P c. Whereas, when I have a higher value of P by P c the value of gamma is small. In other words let us write it out when when the value of P by P c is let us say large that is when we consider 0 0.1 effect of gamma that is variations in gamma does not influence whereas, when I had the value of P by P c of the order of 0 0.001 what happened when you looked at the curve the curve was like this with respect to gamma this is V j when the value of P by P c was of the order of 0 0.1 it was flat and therefore, what does it tell you? If I have something like a rocket for which the expansion ratio is not very high like a cold gas rocket I can even use helium. Helium has gamma of 1.67 whether I use helium or I use air of 1.4 it really does not ma make things worse and therefore, a cold gas rocket normally uses a light gas like helium and helium has a low molecular mass molecular mass is around 4 gram per mole and therefore, I get the benefit of the molecular mass and I do not lose any effect due to gamma over here. Therefore, what is it I have done so far? All what we have done in this class is we derived this particular equation. We looked at the effect of temperature, molecular mass, expansion ratio and also gamma on V j. We told ourselves for a cold gas rocket for which P c need not be very high the effect of gamma is not dominant, but if I were to look at the effect of temperature in a chemical rocket for which temperature is high I can operate at a much lower value of P e by P c and gamma effects will also become significant. Therefore, by now we must be very clear that if I were to have a choice of propellants for my rocket I must have propellants which will generate a high temperature a low molecular mass gases which if I can operate with a high temperature high pressure I will be much better off. Gamma I do not have much control, 
but gamma is not very controlling provided the pressure ratio is not not too low that means p by p c must not be a very low number. I think this is all about this jet velocity I think all the conclusions from this we have to now relate to choice of propellants and this is how we will start dealing with solid propellant rockets, chemical propellant rockets and other forms of rockets. In the next class what I will do is see our aim has been to get a high value of the jet velocity. Now the question is should I have a vent which is straight? What must be the shape of this vent which will give me a high value of velocity? In other words I am getting into the chapter of nozzle, shaping of nozzle what are the problems in a nozzle and that is what we will address in the next class. Well, thank you then.